نا بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما رب العالمين so I thought inshallah as we resume the series the halaqa do something a little bit different like a digression a detour and we'll see inshallah if you are interested and we can return to Riyadh al-Salihin or do something else but this thing that I chose is not long it's short it's a small book by Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi rahimahullah and it's called Wasiyatu Ibn Qudama the Wasiyah the will the advice of Ibn Qudama and Ibn Qudama before we go into the book we have to understand who the author is and the author is uh, famous even if we don't really know about him but those who are in into Islamic history and Islamic scholarship will never fail to realize who Ibn Qudam al-Maqdisi is a person of distinction who lived in the 6th century Hijri and was of the eminent scholars of that century one of the books that he left, in fact, you know, underneath, like a subtitle in the book, and the book, and it's in Arabic, unfortunately, it's not in English. No worries, because I'm going to translate most of it, inshallah, at least the meaning I'm going to transmit to you in English. But that copy, a scanned copy, is available. I shared that with, um, on Facebook. So it actually says that in, in the title, as a subtitle, Sahib al Mughni, the author of al Mughni. Al Mughni is one of the famous books of fiqh. The entire history of Islam, there really are some books of fiqh that stand out. And one of them is the book that is called Al Mughni. It's not only a book in Hanbali fiqh, it's far more than that. And it's an exhaustive book that talks about other madhabs, considers evidence, goes through detail, and it's deep. And it's many, many volumes. And the distinction of this book is only a reflection of the distinction of the person who wrote it. And to the extent, and all those of you who've read, if you got in your hand on the Arabic copy and you read a little bit about the author, it tells you that an author such as Al Izz ibn Abd al Salam, a scholar such as Al Izz ibn Abd al Salam, one of the famous sayings of his, he says, I was not comfortable giving fatwa until I obtained a copy of that book, which is the book of Al Mughni. And somewhere else, I mean, related to this, but it's not mentioned here, he says, like, there are three books in Islam, and if a person gets them, studies them, and understands them, that person can give fatwa. So he says, the book of Al Mughni, and the book of Al Muhalla by Ibn Hazm, so the Mughni by Ibn Qudama, the Muhalla of Ibn Hazm, and if I'm not mistaken, he says, as Sunan al Kubra by Al Bayhaqi. I think he mentioned that. Or, or Al Dhahabi added As Sunan al Kubra al Bayhaqi. As he says, if you have these, you're, you're set. So that tells you about how grounded, how established Ibn Qudama was in knowledge. Now, the reason that Ibn Qudama is distinguished is not only because of how much he knew, but we also suppose that he is one of the people who also combined ilm and amal. We suppose knowledge and action both together. Because you can have only knowledge. You can memorize a lot. And you can know a lot. But you can apply very little. You look at the biography and the life history of Ibn Qudama and you'll notice that he knew a lot, but you looked at him throughout the day, what his routine was. Teaching, writing, sitting with people, answering their questions. Filling his time with ibadah between Maghrib and Isha and after Isha. They say about him that when he would sit and talk to people and even when he debates, he'll be always smiling. That always tells you about the good nature of this person and how much he has or could happen, she has in his heart, in his heart and in her heart. That they're always smiling even in the face of someone who's trying to disprove their position. But so he was a person who had combined both we think ilm and amal, and a person of distinction. And subhanAllah, I mean his children, 
maybe did not reach his level, but still followed on his footstep of being immersed in scholarship. So his great-grandchild is the one who abbreviated Minhaj al Qasidin. So if you know about Muhtasar or Minhaj al Qasidin, he is his great-grandchild who abbreviated that. And it's a famous book, more well-known among the public than Al-Mughni, but Al-Mughni is a far more benefit when in terms to understanding Islam and the practice of Islam. So inshallah, what we want to do inshallah is to go through this book. And as I said, it's a small thing. It's not a big thing. Go through it with commentary, understanding, additions, reflection. This is what we want. So there's a brief introduction. I want to start with the brief introduction. And in it, he tells you, rahimahullah, why he wrote the book. He says that a brother, a righteous brother, came and asked me, write me an advice that I can take benefit and read. And in the beginning he says, I didn't want to do it. I declined. Why did he decline? He says, because Because I know that for myself I'm imperfect. Not only that I am imperfect, I don't follow the advice that I give. And I do not apply what I need to apply. So how can I give advice to someone else? If I, I am myself, look at myself and find that I am flawed. And here there's a lesson, inshallah. Come back to it, there's a lesson, or a couple of them. But obviously he reconsidered. And why did he reconsider? He says, but I reconsidered out of hope that Allah will reward me for fulfilling the need of my brother answering his call and fulfilling his request and the dua that he may make for me and that Allah will grant me a reward because of what I have done because I'm guiding people to the truth even though I may fail to follow it myself but when I guide them to it it will be written as if I've done it so one is us to consider subhanallah his motivation for writing it and his initial reluctance the mark of a true taqwa and true knowledge is not believing that you're the best. In fact, at any stage where you believe that you have but the best, that you have reached perfection, that in itself is a sign of imperfection. When you believe that you, ha- you know it all, that is a sign that you don't know enough. You don't know anything. Because the most important thing that you should know, especially when it comes to Islam, is how insignificant you are in your knowledge compared to Allah Azza wa Jal, and how much He knows. Not only how much He knows, but how much also the servants and the slaves of Allah on this earth know. So when you're comparing yourself to others and you think that you're better than them and you know more than them, that is evidence of my ignorance and your ignorance if we believe this. So here, Rahimahullah, first he exhibits humility. A not affected fabricated humility. Oh, pretend that you're modest so that people say that you're modest even though you're in yourself. You don't believe that you're that modest. It's not that. But in fact, believing indeed that you're not as good as other people and you're not as knowledgeable as other people because you could know more verses of the Quran but the other person who knows less could follow them better. And in the scale of knowledge, who's better? Who? The person who knows more but does not follow or the person who knows best, less but follows what he knows? Who's better? The second, and that is a person who is truly knowledgeable. Not the first. The second is a person who will be counted as a truly knowledgeable person, not the first. So it's not only how much you know. So here, Rahimahullah, he says, Indeed, I know and I recognize myself that I am not up to the level where I could give advice. Subhanallah. I cannot, and you always have to think of yourself as that. See yourself as that, as this imperfect human being who's sinful before Allah Azza wa Jal. And subhanAllah, this knowledge, right, is like the sea. Ilm in Islam is like the sea. The more that you go in it, the more that you realize that it is what? Deep, very deep, very complex. And that you cannot reach its end. 
unless you expect, you can expect that you can swim to the other end of the sea. You cannot reach its end. You can give it all that you have, meaning yani, all seconds of your life, and you'll not reach its end. So that, the more that you know that actually, the more that this proves our own imperfection. And then the more that you compare what you do to what others have done throughout the history of Islam and also to how much you owe Allah, you'll realize that you're not doing much. Not doing much. Right? So, this is why when he looked at himself, he says, no, I'm not going to give it. But then he said, let me then give it. Let me give this advice. Why? Though Even though I am imperfect in myself, I am expecting, I'm hoping from Allah that when I do it, I'm helping my brother, I'm helping my sister. And Allah rewards for that. And maybe when I help them during my life or afterwards, somebody will make dua for me. And that is also another benefit. And the third one is The one who guides to goodness is like the one who does it. That is there. One of the greatest motivations from the Prophet wasallam, even though you may find yourself unable for whatever reason, whether we have excuses or not, unable or unwilling to do something. Even if you find yourself physically, spiritually, and not at that level to perform that thing that you know. That should not stop you from first of all recognizing that this is the truth and sharing that with others so it does not die. So you can spread it and propagate it. And the Prophet said, if you guide somebody else to the truth, it will be counted. You will get the reward of the person who has done it. Isn't that great? You see how easy it is? Well, actually, it's not easy. Guiding people to the truth is not easy. I, I tricked you. You see how easy it is? It's not easy. All right? Some parts of it are easy. Brother, this is the sunnah, this is the hadith, this is the ayah, zakallah khair, this and that, alhamdulillah. Other parts of it are difficult. Because right? there is resistance and friction and rejection sometimes. No, this is what I know, not you're wrong. So people will fight with you and criticize you and all of that. But still, if you at least convey that knowledge to people, there will be someone who will follow it. If not now, later, there will be someone who will follow it. And at least you'll be like someone who has preserved this knowledge, even if though he's not applying it, preserved this knowledge and then transmitted this to another person. I don't want this to be an excuse. Oh, okay, I'm not going to do anything, but you know, at least I'm gonna, just going to transmit. Okay? Somebody was just complaining um, a couple of hours ago when I was talking to him. He says, I received through social media so many da'wah clips, I'm just fed up, right? Like people just start keep, you know, forwarding to me, forwarding to me. I don't have time to watch all of this. And I told them it's probably the case that they even themselves, they haven't watched all of that. But what is it that they're doing? Is that whenever they find something they find, okay, maybe this is useful, they send it, they send it, they send it, right? We have to be moderate about how much you send. Otherwise, all of them cancel each other. So just be selective. But that is sort of the idea is that if you're unable, right? You have a Qur'an, right? And you're not reading from the Qur'an, please read from the Qur'an. But also, right, if, if you have an extra copy, don't keep it there. Give it to someone who's going to read it. You have extra money that you can buy. You don't like to read, but you know somebody who likes to read. Buy them the books that they can read so that they can gain knowledge. You know of a good lecture, of a good muhadara, of a good series, and you're not going to listen to it, but you know that it's really beneficial. You share it with others selectively. You share it with others. And this is the way that good spreads. They, they propagate, they advertise falsehood. You know how much money is spent on falsehood? How much money? All, all that entertainment, right? Is by falsehood, for falsehood, so you need to be an advertiser for good. So send it, share it, talk to others about it. Because this is the way that you saturate the airwaves so that everything or most of the things that you hear relate back to Allah Azza wa Not to the disobedience of Allah, but to Allah. And that is, that is the saturated environment of Iman. What is the difference between one of the main differences of living in a Muslim country and a non-Muslim country is the saturation level of Iman. The saturation level where you will find Allah or hear about Allah more often. That makes a difference. Versus Muslim living in a place, whatever that place is, that does not have much of that. So, the first chapter, 
And this is what he begins with. And the title that the editor had chosen for it is Al Mubadar il Amal, Hastening to Do Good Things. And the subtitle is Al Dunya Fursatun Fartanimha. This life is an opportunity, so take advantage of it. Interesting. He's going to mention one very interesting thing. He says, This dunya, this world, is like your farmland, it's like your business. And you're in it, the farmer and the businessman. It is here that you collect your harvest. It is here that you do your transactions and get your profit. And it is this profit and that harvest that you carry with you to where? Where do you take it? To the hereafter. Mazra'atul Akhirah. وَمَجَّرُوا أَرْبَاحِهَا وَمَوْضِعُوا تَحْصِيلِ الزَّادِ مِنْهَا That is, if you're going to travel and you need provisions, foods and drinks, your zad, your food and drink comes to you from this dunya. You're not going to get it in the akhirah. Akhirah, there is no action anymore. But your provision comes from the dunya. And your money comes from the dunya, money for the akhirah. And your crop and your harvest comes from the dunya. So he said, take advantage of it because it is because of this dunya that those who are successful were successful. And those who have reached the finish line, reached the finish line, and those who have failed, failed. It's because of this. Then the very interesting thing he says, and know that this life is the wish of the people of the hereafter, whether they are in Jannah or in Hellfire. See, when it's framed this way, you say, wait, I'm like, always thinking about the time I want to leave, right? I, sh I can't wait to go to Jannah, right? I want to leave this place. Let me go to Jannah, let me go to Jannah. Then he comes and tells you that the people of Jannah are wishing for this life and you have to say, okay, how is that? But not only the people of Jannah, but also the people of Hellfire. It's easy to understand why the people of Hellfire want to come back, right? Then he quotes a couple of ayahs. وَهُمْ يَسْتَرِخُونَ فِيهَا رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا نَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا غَيْرَ الَّذِي كُنَّا نَعْمَلْ he says, they will be screaming in hellfire, obviously. Screaming in hellfire. Ya Allah, take us out of it. So that we will do something, good deeds, righteousness, better than what we used to do. So the people of hellfire, obviously, are asking and pleading with Allah Azza wa Jal. Ya Allah, just take us out so that we can go back to the dunya and do something differently. And Allah also mentions that even before they get into it, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذْ وُخِفُوا عَلَى النَّارِ فَقَالُوا يَا لَيْتَنَا نُرَدُّ وَلَا نُكَذِّبَ بِآيَاتِ رَبِّنَا وَنَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He says, what, what would happen or what, imagine the scene where they will see them standing, right, next to hellfire, knowing that they're going to go to hellfire, فَقَالُوا They will say, we wish that we would be taken back, where? To this dunya, and that we would not deny any of the ayat of Allah and would be among the believers. So all of the people of hellfire, their wish is, Ya Allah, just take us out of here and send us back to the dunya. So is that the same for the people of Jannah? He says in the hadith that the martyrs, the shuhada, they will have their souls inside, you probably know this, inside what in Jannah? Green birds. And they will fly wherever they want in Jannah. Allah will give them that freedom wherever they fly in Jannah. And then they will find and go to, go to for rest uh, in lanterns beneath the throne of Allah Azza wa Jal. So see how high they are. This is the highest thing. That is the highest level. So the throne of Allah has lanterns. These birds will fly, 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 eat wherever they want. These are the shuhada. They're carrying the shuhada. Then they will come back to these lanterns. And says, as they are doing all of this, Allah Azza wa Jal will look at them and could dress them. And He says, ask me for whatever you want. It's an open wish. Right? Anything in Jannah, anything that you can think about, anything that you can imagine, anything that your hearts desire, just ask me. And the only thing that they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, return our souls to our bodies so that we will go back to the dunya, so that we will be killed again for your sake. So the highest people of Jannah, we're talking about the shuhada, the highest people of Jannah, the best of the people of Jannah, their only wish in Jannah is what? What is it? To come back where? Here. 
to be sent back here because they see so much of the honor of Allah Azza wa Jal and how much they are celebrated that they want to wish to experience this again and also add to it. Add to that honor, add to that karama, add to that love that they're receiving from Allah Azza wa Jal. And he says here, Rahimahullah, he says, Brother, no. Brother, may Allah be merciful with you, no. Allah knows that this is what they're going to ask. And he knows that he's not going to send them back to the dunya. He only wanted to let the believers in this life know that this is their wish. So that people in this dunya will push harder. So you, go, you want to ask yourself, I know that sometimes a brother and a sister will ask, Okay, didn't Allah know that they're going to say this? Why is he asking them? Because Allah Azza wa wants to show them and us something. Meaning, they see what they're saying? Here, this is what they're saying. Learn something from it that they want to be here, then you are here. And then he says, he quotes Ibrahim al-Taymi, rahimahullah, he says, he imagines. And this is, by the way, um, a beautiful exercise, if you can do it. Tafakkur. We're going to go, we're going to do, yani, inshallah, he's going to talk about it, but tafakkur. Tafakkur means I imagine myself, Ibrahim al-Taymi, he says, I imagine myself in Jannah, sitting in Jannah. You can imagine yourself, right? Sitting in Jannah. And you have this big house, and lush and big trees, palaces, and you know the rivers and the uh, jewelry and the gold and the silver and all of this. Then if you ask yourself, what is it that you want? Because everything is all here, what is it that you want? Yourself will tell you, I want to go back to the dunya so I can do more, so I can earn more of this. More of this. So he says, fine. Then he says, then I imagine myself in hellfire. And I'm inside this fire being burned from left and right. Given this drink that will melt and subhanAllah take away all of your, all of your inside, melt them away. Burn everything on the inside. And the ugly scenes, the ugly torture, the, oh, then what do, you, what do you want? What do you want at this point? He says just to leave, to come back to this dunya. So that I could do one thing that could save me from it. So then he says to himself, Ya nafsu fa'anti fil umniyati fa'amali. He says, O oh, oh self, you have your wish. Yes, if you imagine yourself being transported to those two homes, and then what do you wish here? What do you wish there? And it's the same wish. He says, Okay, self, you have your wish now. Come back, huh? You have your wish now. Do something about it. SubhanAllah. Transport yourself now and do something about it. He says, Some of the salaf, some of the early ancestors, he says, and not, not, I'm not going to recommend this, but anyway, at least it's something that he has done. He says he had dug himself a grave, right? Maybe inside his home, I don't know where he dug it, but he dug himself a grave. And he, if he felt tired of worship, lazy, he comes, goes down to that grave and he lies down. And then he says to himself, imagine that you're dead and you're being wrapped and you're inside here. What do you want? He says, to go back to the dunya that I would do something useful. He says, okay, now you have your wish. Stand and do something useful. So I'm not going to recommend, right, that you go and find a, a piece of land and you dig your own grave and you lie down there. I'm not going to recommend this. I mean, this is, wasn't, not, not something that the Prophet ﷺ did. But you can do something similar to it. What is similar? Without digging anything, getting close to. What can you do? Visit the graveyard, yeah. One is, okay, so visit the graveyard. If you find that your heart is really hard, wash the dead, volunteer. Wash the dead once in a while and see. See how it feels. See that this is the one person lying in front of you was just living maybe a few hours ago. And now that he's dead, visit the sick. Come close to the afflicted and needy and those who are, you know, subhanAllah, in distress. Feel their pain and that will tell you, that will tell you, that will revive maybe in bi'ithnillah that energy that you will have to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, no, rahimahullah, i'lam rahimakallah, that the people of the graves, their, in, uh, their wish is for one of them to say one tasbiha, that it can increase his hasanah. Or that to be able to repent from one sin that will forgive him one of his sins. Or that he will do one rak'ah that will raise him one level. 
This is their wish. And he reports here a story. Allahu alam if it happened or not, but what's important is the benefit and the moral of the story. He says that I, it is reported that a person prayed to rak'az next to a grave. Now obviously the grave and the cemetery is not a place for you to pray. It just happened. It's not recommended, it's not sunnah for you to pray in the graveyard. So anyway, he prayed to rak'az next to a grave and then he reclined on it. And then he slept. He saw the person of the grave, one who is dead, in the dream. While he was asleep, he saw him. He says, move away. You're like, you're, you harmed me. Move away. Okay? And then he told him, Wallahi, that those two rak'ahs that you prayed, if they were to me, to belong to me, they're most precious, more precious to me than everything on the face of this earth. إِنَّكُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ وَلَا أَتَعْلَمُونَ He says, you're doing, but you have no knowledge. وَنَحْنُ نَعْلَمُ وَلَا نَعْمَلْ When we know, but we cannot do. He says, we know. Because we've seen. We've seen reality. But we can't do anything about it. Subhanallah. See, this is Allah's test. Once you see reality, the truth, certainty, you can't work anymore. It's done for you, right? And once you see the angels of Allah Azza wa Jal, meaning khalas, إِذَا بَلَغَتُ الْحُلْقُومِ It's here. You see the angels of Allah, sorry, it's done. Because now it's certain for you that you know that this is true. That's not what Allah wants from you. He wants compliance, love, before you see that certainty. So He says you're doing, but you have no knowledge. Your knowledge is very weak or you're very ignorant. And what you're, so, what you're supposed to do is what? To increase your knowledge so that your actions follow that knowledge. So, but notice what he said. Those two rak'ahs that you prayed, I wouldn't exchange them for anything on the face of this earth. You see the two rak'ahs that we pray after Maghrib? We don't even pay attention to them. Guilty as charged, right? We don't even pay attention to them. Rak'ahs after Isha, rak'ahs, we don't pay attention. You just pray and you just go on. You pray and you don't pay attention to them. He says, if only those two rak'ahs, I don't want anything else from the dunya if I could have them because nothing else transfers except those two. I'll give you an example. Imagine you're taking your currency, thousands of dollars in your pocket. You go to a country, you look at it and you say, I'm sorry, we don't know what this is. We can't really exchange this currency. What is this worth? The thousands of dollars there. Nothing. You're walking like a poor person, maybe somewhere else, but like a poor person. Can someone help me? This is, what, this is paper now. But maybe, maybe subhanAllah, if you had a piece of gold with you, a piece of silver with you, uh, that would be worth something. So there's some currency in this dunya that does not transfer to the akhirah. And there's some currency that transfers. So houses, cars, gold and silver does not transfer, stops, stays with the people of dunya. Even if you get, you get buried with it, it doesn't really you go with you. The only currency that transfers is your ibadah. That's why he says, I don't need anything else from the dunya. I know it doesn't benefit me. Two rak'ahs, that's enough. So imagine yourself, subhanAllah, the next time you pray two rak'ahs. Um, imagine yourself like that person in the grave and say to yourself, Do I really, should I not pray them in a way that I believe will benefit me when I'm in my grave, let me pray them in this way. And if your ibadah is like that, right? if more of our ibadah is like that, subhanAllah, our ibadah will be different. And our relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal will be different. He says something, inshaAllah, that I would like to read and translate, because I think it's, it's beautiful. He says, Know that, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ مُدَّةَ حَيَاتِكَ مَحْدُودًا Your life is very limited. And your breath that you're taking, is also counted and limited. Every breath that you take, takes a part of you away. Part of you goes away with it. And all of this life is short. All of this life is short. And what is left from your uh, life, is even shorter than the short. Right? All of this life is short. And what is part of this life, is even shorter than the short. And every part of it, every second of it, is like an invaluable, Piece of jewelry, and an invaluable diamond. Jawharatun nafisa. La idda laha wa la khalafa minha. Nothing is equal to it, and nothing can compensate if it is lost. 
Because in this small thing that we call this life, you will gain eternity in the hereafter. Or eternity, and eternity in Jannah, or eternity in hellfire with punishment. It says, if you try to compare these two, you will know that every breath that you take is better than a thousand, thousand, thousand years in a blessing that has no limit to it. And what is like that has no equal value on this earth. That is, he's count trying to approximate. He said, every breath that you take is better than a billion years. Actually, it's more. But let's just stay with a billion. More than a billion years. Because you would earn with it eternity. That is saying, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, earns you so much that is better than a billion years. Because you're buying with it what cannot be bought except with this hasanat and those sayings. Right? So he says, do not waste those incredibly priceless jewels without any act. Yani every, subhanAllah, if you think about it, and maybe, does he say it here? Okay, so he said, I'm not going to repeat it. Let me read it and then I'll come back to it. It says, Wala Don't waste it without some a compensation that will come back to you. And make sure that no breath that you're going to be taking or is going to go away except that it is mixed with an obedience of Allah Azza wa Jal or something that will bring you closer to it. Because Wallahi, he's saying that if you have a jewel of the jewels of this dunya and you lost it, you'll be incredibly sad because of that. He says, not even that, if you had a dinar, what, a hundred dollars, let's say you had a hundred dollars and you lost it, you'll blame yourself, how did, I, how did I lose it and where did it go? And everybody, come on and let's look for it. And the times, your life, you waste them and you're not sad because you're wasting them. And nothing can compensate for your life. You can lose money and earn money back. But you cannot lose life and earn life back. What's gone is gone. So, subhanAllah, yani, as other scholars and he has said, the thing that is most, you know, um, the priciest thing that you have, the most valuable thing that you have, is your life, is your seconds and minutes and hours and days. And the thing that is easiest for you to waste without any sorrow is your time. And that's the irony of humanity. That's the irony of humanity. We are sad because of losing this dunya. And I'm not at telling you not to be sad and not to have emotions about it, but compare the level of sadness. I don't wake up for Fajr. And I miss it. Because I was negligent. My fault. I didn't just oversleep. My fault. When I wake up in the morning, do I feel that I really lost something? I delay my salah. Delay it, delay it, delay it. Very close to the end. And sometimes I miss it and it goes into the other salah. And sometimes I miss it. I pray it five minutes before. Do I feel that I lost something? Or is it just as usual? Life as usual. I feel nothing inside of me. Whereas if somebody comes and tells me, right, that they have a flat tire, my day is ruined. For a flat tire. If somebody comes and tells me you lost a little bit of the dunya, my week and month is ruined. But you and I do not feel sad because of the akhirah, because we do not appreciate it. So we're ready, easily wasting it. Let me kill time. Subhanallah, except very few of us, all of us are guilty of this. I want to waste some, some time. I'm tired, I'm this, I'm that, let me waste my time. An hour, two hours, three hours, six hours go. You count how many hours a week that you spend in something beneficial versus something that is wasteful. And then you think to yourself, and I want the highest levels of Jannah, right? It's like going to a student and he says, I want to be an A student. Graduate among the top students in my school, in my college, in my university. And you look at him and he's playing games and he's going out with his friends. He says, you can't be, you're not really serious about all of this. You either devote the time, you either feel that every A deserves an hour and days from you, or you be honest with yourself. You can't be seeking the dunya and the akhirah, both without really working for the akhirah, but only for the dunya. That does not work. And he says, he gives an example takes few pages, so I'll inshallah just summarize it for you. He gives an example. And we are 825? I'm sorry? 820. 820, inshallah. 
as you can't see, there's some reflection. He says, imagine a people that were on a ship and they were forced to take refuge on an island on their journey, right? They had to dock in an island. So they tell, told all the crew, all the passengers on that ship, you have 24 hours on this island and then we're going to board and then we're going to leave. And then they did find on this island some jewelry, right? Expensive gold and silver and diamonds and all of that. So the crew or the captain said to the people and the passengers and everybody else, try to gather as much valuable as you can and bring them back to you at the end of the 24 hours to the ship. So he said then people were divided into four categories. The first category were the people who started collecting diligently with all effort as much as they can of these valuable right, gems and stones, taking as many of them as they can. And if they get tired, they say to themselves, it's only 24 hours. And if they are sleepy, it's time for them to sleep. They say to themselves, what? It's only 24 hours. Stay up. It's only 24 hours. You can sleep when? You go back to the ship. Rest when you go back to the ship. But now, it's not time for you to rest. Collect as much as you can. So they collect and collect and collect. That's the first category. The second category are people who went collecting these stones, precious stones. But then when they got tired, they sat down and relaxed. And when it was time for them to sleep, they slept. Then they went back to the ship with something, but it's not like the first. The third, rather than collecting these valuable stones, they went and collected rocks, wood. That's what they collected. Then they came back with that. And the last, instead of collecting anything, they started building homes. Right? And you know, working on the fields. And then when the 24 hours were done, they had to come back. So they took everybody back to their home, and the king interviewed all of them. He said to the first, what have you collected? He said, this and this and this. So this qualifies you to be a king like me. So he made them kings, each one of them, with, all, with their own soldiers, with their own palaces, and this and this and that. The second category, he comes and he asks them, what did you have? He said, we have this. He says, weren't you with them? He says, yes. On the same island? Yes. Had the same time? Yes. What happened to you? He says, we were lazy. We were lazy. They did benefit. They got collected stuff, but not as much. And then he tells them, look at those kings. You could have been one of them. If you just had pushed yourself. The third category are the imbeciles. Meaning, like, what, what are you brought with you? What is this? Was that the best thing that you had? And the last category are the most stupid, right? They were building in a place that they knew that they cannot inhabit and cannot, cannot stay in. So that is the example of this dunya. This is what he says. That's the example of the dunya. Allah Azza wa put you on it and asked you, work for the akhirah because your time here is limited. And then the captain of the ship is going to call you back. Come, your time is up. So he says now, think about it. Every time you get tired and lazy and you say to yourself, I, I don't want to do any, any, any of this anymore, say to yourself, it's only 24 hours. It's only 24 hours and you're going to leave. This haram is so attractive, I cannot stay out, away from it. Say to yourself, just wait 24 hours. Then you're going to board the ship and you're going to go and leave it. I want to build this great thing and this great thing and then it's just going to consume all of my life. And I'm not going to have time to collect any of those stones. Say to yourself, build a little bit here and a little bit there, but spend more of your time collecting those stones. It's only 24 hours. How much do you want to enjoy here? Those who, those who have enjoyed it before you, towards the end of their life, go and talk to them. It just passes like a dream. As if it wasn't. It's only 24 hours. So... Allah Azza wa Jal subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you these parables whether they are in the Quran or the Sunnah or through the ulama to tell you that you should work for the Akhirah and think about how valuable it is. And then the last part of this uh, chapter inshallah, I want to read it because it's valuable. 
He says, وَأَلْزِمْ قَلْبَكَ الْفِكْرَ فِي نِعَمِ اللَّهِ لِتَشْكُرَهَا He says, force your heart, let it adhere to thinking about the ni'am of Allah, the bounties of Allah upon you, so that you can thank them. And to think about your sins so that you can ask Allah to forgive him. وَفِي تَفْرِيطِكَ And you're in your transgressions so that you will regret that. So what should you think about, he's saying. Because this year, you can think about anything in this world. He says, I want to recommend things to, that you would think about. Think about all the ni'mah that Allah had given to you. And if we are sometimes blind to the ni'mahs of Allah, look at those who are less fortunate, and you'll discover your ni'mah of Allah upon you. Right? Sometimes you need to seek them. Sometimes you need to seek them, to find them. And then you will appreciate the ni'mah of Allah upon you. So think about the ni'mah of Allah. And then you will appreciate them and then you will thank Allah. Not be thankless for all the things that you don't have, but thankful for so, so many things that you have. And then think about your sins. I disobeyed Allah at that time. I disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this thing. When you remember this, that this brings regret. So you will regret those things and ask Allah to forgive those sins. And protect from... Uh, arrogance. وَفِي مَخْلُوقَاتِ اللَّهِ وَحِكَمِهِ لِتَعْرِفَ عَظَمَتَهُ وَحِكْمَتَهُ And think about the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal in the heavens and in the earth and about what He had deposited in them وَحِكَمَهُ right? How He had created them so that you understand His greatness and His wisdom. Because observing how Allah created and the wisdom that He deposited in these things that you see around you and in yourself tells you about the wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this means that you have to take that time. So يعني, brothers and sisters, sometimes you think of ibadah as what? Salah and siyam and fasting and coming to the masjid and this is all ibadah and of the best of ibadah. But he's talking also about another type of ibadah that I think is neglected. Think about Allah's creation and how many of us does that? How many of us spend time thinking about Allah's creation so that this can increase your taqwa? Think about the harmony that is in it, the laws that are in it, the hikmah of Allah that is in it, observing it, so that you can increase your iman. Just looking at the sky, looking at the moon, looking how, how, about how great it is. Looking about how small the ants, you know, the insects that Allah had created and how incredible they are, and that would increase your uh, admiration, respect for Allah Azza wa Jal. So think about all this so that you'll recognize Allah's greatness and wisdom and in what lies ahead. The hereafter and death and what, what leads to it so that you would get ready for it. Okay, or about things that you need to know so that you, so that you would learn it. And he says, and let your tongue adhere and stay close to the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. And his dua and asking him for forgiveness and the reading of the Quran or knowledge or teaching people or commanding good or forbidding evil or fixing and mending relations between people. He's giving you the supply. He's giving you the supply. Busy your mind, that's the first paragraph. Busy your mind with thinking about these things and now busy your tongue with the worship of Allah Azza wa So there is the worship of the mind and the heart of the tafakkur. And there is also the worship of the tongue. As much as you can, let your tongue move with the dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. With asking for forgiveness, with reading the Quran, with learning, or with teaching, or directing people to the good that they should do, or the harm that they should away from, the sins that they should stay away from. Or having that intention, I'm gonna fix what has, right? What is broken between people. I wanna bring them together. And then, mind and heart. Then, tongue. Now he says, وَأَشْغِلْ جَوَارِحَكَ بِالطَّاعَاتِ And let your now limbs and body be busy with the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. And let the most important of them be the obligations on their time in the best way performed. To be performed in the best way. So he says, now your body also needs to move in the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. What is the best? What's your priority? Obligations, fara'id, the compulsory deeds, on time, meaning don't delay them, in the best of ways. Because this is why Allah Azza wa Jal made them an obligation, and this is why Allah had set a time for them. 
And then after that, what its benefit reaches other people. This is of the best of deeds, subhanAllah. وَأَفْضَلُ ذَلِكَ مَا نَفَعَهُمْ فِي دِينِهِمْ And the best of that is what benefits them in their religion, like teaching them the deen and guiding them to the straight path. So he see, see what he's asking you to do? Mind, tongue, and then with the body, and he emphasized two things. And I'm going to stop inshallah. He emphasized two things. The obligations, take care of them, and don't neglect them. And then think about ways that you can benefit and help other people with your life. How? How can I help other people with it? Guide them to the truth. Right? That's the best thing. If not, helping them with money, helping them with whatever guidance, advice, you know, uh, just giving them a shoulder that they can cry on, listening to their problems, all that is good and wonderful. If you can rise to the level where you're teaching them your, their religion, this could include your spouse, your children, your family, an extended family. You could be their teacher. If you can do that, then by Allah Azza wa we hope that you are among the selected few that Allah had chosen to transmit His religion. Inshallah. And I want to stop here, inshallah. Um, and as I said, it's not a big book, inshallah. Allahu alam. Um, may not take us maybe a month or less, inshallah, and we'll finish it. Uh, the next chapter is about Mufsidatul A'mal, what invalidates the deeds. After you do them, what invalidates the deeds? And inshallah, before I take any questions, if there are any questions, I do believe that next Saturday will be what? What's next Saturday? Ashura? Am I right? Okay, so here you have an option. You can still have the halaqa, or we can have a condensed halaqa, give you time to eat inshallah, and then we can have it, or we can cancel it. So, let me know what you want. Huh? Keep the halaqa. Do you want us to condense it so we give you time for us to eat? And then come back and have a shorter halaqa? Do you want to do this or you want to have, you say, oh, no, nah, I'm, I'm a trooper, I'm going to stay and not eat till after Isha. Not up to you, it doesn't, Danny. What do you want? Keep it longer. Keep it, keep it this length? So how many people want it to, to, for, it to, for it to stay between Maghrib and Isha? Okay. And how many people want it to be shorter? So we're talking about maybe 30 minutes to 20 minutes. Okay. So the first... That, okay, the first people win. The first win. So inshallah, it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be inshallah full length. Inshallah. Uh, sorry for the other team that did not win. Inshallah, maybe next time. Um, any quick questions? Inshallah, I'm not expecting that there will be questions. We're not talking about something technical, but yeah. Unfortunately, the book is not translated. I looked for it in English, but it's not translated. If anybody's interested in translating it, let me know. I can work with you. Inshallah, on it. Inshallah. But at least the gist of it, I'm, I'm giving it to you, inshallah. At least, inshallah. Inshallah, so... Khair, inshallah. So I think we're good, alhamdulillah. So we'll see you next week, bi-idhnillah. Jazakumullahu khaira for attending and listening. Barakallahu feekum. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa an astaghfiruka wa atubu.